Um, dear guests, uh, partners, friends, good morning, good day, or good evening to each and every one of you. My name is Olga Zavialova, and I'm project manager at IWPR Central Asia. I'm delighted to see all of you here today with us on, at our international expert panel titled, titled uh, Unlocking Central Asia Infrastructure and Energy Potential. Uh, let me welcome all of you here on behalf of the Institute for War and Peace Reporting, Central Asia Division. IWPR Central Asia has been a trusted partner for policymakers, academics, and civil society actors in the region, providing accurate, balanced, and unbiased reporting and analytics on Central Asia political, social, and economic development. Thank you all for joining us today to discuss such an important issue. Uh, the challenges and opportunities surrounding infrastructure and energy projects in Central Asia. The main goal of this expert discussion is to address the slow progress and challenges hindering infrastructure and energy projects development. Today we have a brilliant panel of experts who will explore diversification strategies, uh, reducing dependence on external powers, and opportunities for regional cooperation in energy and infrastructure development. I'm delighted and honored to see such prominent experts here today with us. Uh, and last but not least, uh, this online expert meeting is part of a series under the Amplify, Verify, Engage project, generously funded by the Royal Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. We sincerely thank the Norwegian MFA for being our long-term donor and partner. I'm confident that the discussion today will be insightful, thought-provoking, and productive. Um, I urge all of you to engage in a lively debate, construct constructively challenge each other's ideas, and work together to find solutions. Thank you for your attention. On this note, I'm passing the floor to our moderator for today, uh, Mr. Aldenis Guseinov, a specialist in European and International Studies at the Heartland Expert Analytical Center. Dear Mr. Guseinov, the floor is yours. Dear guests, I extend my sense of gratitude to Olga Zavialo for her warm welcome and for setting the stage for what promises to be an enlightening and constructive discussion. It's my pleasure to moderate this international expert panel by IVPR. Thank you all for joining us to discuss such an important issue for Central Asia nowadays. As the world faces increasing energy demands and the pressing need to transition to a post-carbon global economy, Central Asia holds immense potential for becoming a key player in the global energy infrastructure map. However, to fully unlock this potential, it's crucial to address various, various economic, geopolitical, and environmental factors that shape the region's energy and logistic landscape. By harnessing this potential effectively, we can usher in a new era of economic growth, regional stability, and sustainable development. On this note, let me introduce today's speakers who will shed light on ways to overcome the obstacles in this sphere and chart a course toward a more prosperous future. Dr. Teresa Savonis Health, inaugural chair of the science, technology, and international affairs concentration in the master's degree program at Georgetown University School of Foreign Service. Dr. Roman Bakulchuk, head of climate and energy research group, Norwegian Institute of International Affairs. Dr. Farhot Aminjonov, assistant professor at the National Defense College, Abu Dhabi. Przemyslov Ozerski, expert in Central Asia. Strategic Center for Analysis, Analysis, Dialogue, and Development. I cannot wait to hear your presentations. I'm sure we will have a more clarity on this complicated topic of today's panel. I would like to say to each speaker that you have 10 minutes, please keep track on time. Let me also very briefly touch up some technical regulations. Firstly, we are holding this event on record and taking occasional snapshots. So in case you are not comfortable with that, kindly inform us by writing to our colleagues in the chat box that have an IVPR in the names. However, we would like to appreciate it if you stay with your cameras on so that we have a sense of being all here together. Secondly, please drop your questions in the chat box during the event. We will read them out when the time for the Q&A session comes. Finally, we are providing a simultaneous interpretation during the event. So, this message is for Russian-speaking audience. Дорогие гости, дорогие коллеги, мы обеспечиваем синхронный перевод во время мероприятия. Поэтому, если вы хотите переключиться на русский язык, выберите русский язык на нижней панели в Zoom со знаком Globus. Если у вас возникли проблемы, пожалуйста, напишите нашим представителям, которых вы можете найти в чате с припиской IVPR. Thank you all for your attention. On this note, I'm passing the floor to our keynote speaker, 
Dr. Teresa Sabanis Head. Thank you so much. I'm really honored to have an opportunity to join. I am a big fan of the Institute of War and Peace Reporting and excited to see you taking on this issue. I want to clarify at the outset that I am very excited about renewable energy and its prospects in Central Asia. But given the expertise of my colleagues and given that I'm the first one to speak, my own expertise is in electricity. And I plan to say that I am an expert in electricity. Представить взгляд на энергетику с упором на электричество. То есть переход на новую энергетику. В Центральной Азии сейчас идет второй переход в области энергетики, потому что предыдущий переход в энергетике, который был вызван развалом Советского Союза, до сих пор у нас в воспоминаниях и тот переход, который а, стал толчком misguided or undone with the next reform. We hope for better in this new energy transition, but it is quite understandable why many Central Asia energy sector experts are skeptical about energy transition. When we look at what happened from 1991 to the present, what we can see is that after a period in which electricity demand collapsed altogether, because of industrial collapse, um, Central Asia has rebounded. Every country in Central Asia has more install capacity, more ability to generate electricity now than was the case in 1991. There is a lot of justifiable criticism about legacy electricity systems, but changes have been substantial um, and what we see is that as of 2020, the price of electricity in most Central Asian countries has approached cost recovery. Citizens of Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan, historically, up until 2020, enjoyed relative rel re reliable supply and transparency of price. But when we look at this information, there are two big causes for concern. The first is that the consumption per capita of electricity in Central Asia is still lower than developed country averages, and every country expects to see um, a rise in demand. In fact, the Asian Development Bank, when they look at the Karak region, they predict that by 2030, growth in demand for energy is going to rise in this region by 30% and most of that is going to be in the form of electricity. Um, and this increase in demand is only part of the reason why electricity systems, especially in the past three years, have been showing new signs of strain in our region. First of all, increased urbanization has raised the share of electricity consumed by buildings, by residents, and by commercial sectors. Um, Kyrgyzstan, for example, is reporting that buildings currently account for 60% of increase in, of, of, excuse me, of electricity consumption. So any improvement in industrialization will be additional to the fact that there is this large demand in buildings and that that is rising. The second issue, of course, is that there are record high temperatures in Central Asia, and that has led to increased summer demand. The third, of course, is that changes in the water situation are evident associated with climate change. Um, and in fact, at the first day of this month, um, it was announced in Kyrgyzstan that they are um, understanding this to be a three-year energy emergency associated with lower water levels. And what we see, this combination of both 
increasing unreliability of supply from hydro and increased demand from all sectors, what we see is that the countries that have historically had summer surplus, where they have lots of surplus electricity to sell to the grid, no longer see as high an export potential as they once, as they once um, predicted. Now, from a systems perspective, a grid that is most stable is one that can integrate multiple electricity sources. In the Soviet era, <coughs> excuse, excuse me. In the Soviet era, as many of you know, regional trade in electricity reflected the wisdom of using more summer hydropower from Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan when water was both plentiful and was needed downstream for crop irrigation while winters took advantage of the fossil fuel resources concentrated in Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan and Turkmenistan to light and heat the region. The Central Asia power system was designed to achieve these balances, but as you all are aware, the system began falling apart in 2000, was shut down in 2008, was not resumed until 10 years later in 2018. Um, and now at the present day, what we see is that we're using about 40% of the interconnection capacity that does exist in the region. In my estimation, the CAP system is one historical artifact that's likely to continue in importance for the region now that it is reopened. Achieving that 30% increase in electricity demand will be much more successful if regional trade in electricity can continue to rebound. Now, when we think about the problem of decarbonization, it's really important to remember that part of Central Asia has given itself a longer timeline than Europe. Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, and Tajikistan all have embraced the idea of achieving carbon neutrality by 2050, which is the same timeline as the EU. But gas-rich Turkmenistan and Uzbekistan have not yet embraced a year by which they will be carbon neutral. It is likely that developing economies such as India and China will continue to use fossil fuels even as Europe moves away from fossil fuels. And Central Asia as a region may find itself exercising this option as well. The ambition of transition economies in Central Asia, as well as the ambition of developing economies, will logically depend on the success of the developed world in this endeavor. So, with all of that as background, I see two areas in which Central Asian policy um, requires more attention and discussion. And this will be, I think, my provocation because I think not everyone will agree with me on this. The first is that um, we have to think about nuclear fuel and power plants. When we imagine a future in which Central Asian demand for electricity is rising while carbon footprints decline, we do have to think about the potential role for nuclear power in the region, particularly given Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan's uranium endowments. Um, and in that endeavor, I'm sure many of you are aware of the fact that although for many years, Kazakhstan has produced the largest share of global uranium, most of that's been sent to Russia for processing. And it's been just since December, 2022, so less than a year um, that Kazakhstan has begun producing fuel assemblies from Atom has certified the Kazakh facility as being capable of producing many more. Um, and there are still a lot of proliferation and management concerns, but I think it's very clear that Kazakhstan and potentially Uzbekistan will be rising in nuclear fuel production um, and that this will be tied to development of nuclear energy in the region and development of nuclear energy requires a strong regional grid so that you have a larger community across which you can spread nuclear power. Given our current technological endowments, most nations cannot effectively use nuclear as more than 30% of their grid. And that means that there's gonna be a lot of continuing need for trade. And then of course, uh, the other issue I want to raise, which some of you will regard as uh, controversial, has to do with demand management. You may be well aware that the 14th five-year plan uh, announced in China banned Bitcoin and China had been the lead producer. Because of the banning of Bitcoin and of equipment that produces Bitcoin, 
Um, China banned the equipment in September 2021. That is why Bitcoin moved very rapidly to Central Asia. That is what caused a lot of the grid crashes in fall of 2021 across Central Asia. Um, it was the unexpected explosion of Bitcoin production. A single Bitcoin transaction consumes as much energy as a typical American household consumes in one month. It is extremely energy intensive, and it is the kind of industry that regulation by country in the interests of the whole region will be critical if we are to move forward into an era where Central Asia can share its energy um, across regions, have an effective regional system, um, things like Bitcoin that deliver shocks to the system need to be strongly improved in terms of how they are regulated. And as a concluding sort of comment in terms of demand management, I'd like to point out that although Russia has led the world in crypto entrepreneurs and exporting them to former Soviet regions, Russia itself strongly limits uh, Bitcoin because of the shocks that it regularly delivers uh, to electricity grids. All right, with all of that in mind, I'd like to pass it to our next panelist and thank you for your attention. Thanks a lot, Dr. Savanis Head, for your in-depth analysis about Central Asia power systems. And actually, actually uh, you have touched on so many topics in such a short time. Uh, uranium mining in Kazakhstan is particularly interesting in, against the backdrop of events in West Africa. And based on that, let's move. Um, let's let's now delve into the topic of sustainable connectivity in Central Asia and move on to our next speaker, uh, Farhot Aminjonov, about prospects for building new energy partnerships. Um, all right. Um, hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Well, uh, thank you very much for organizing an event on such a timely and important topic. So I'll, I, I, um, I'll try to be uh, short, uh, but at the same time, I, I, I really want to share some of the insights. First, I was planning to talk about new partnerships, how Central Asian countries can and should develop stronger ties with South Asian countries and uh, uh, Gulf investors. But then having looked at the agenda, I found so many interesting points in there that I decided maybe I should reflect on them and then at the very end, suggest, make some recommendations on how uh, um, Central Asian policymakers should proceed in order to improve the situation. All right, so um, uh, um, like in the event description, uh, thank you very much. It was well laid out and uh, uh, presented. I, I, I noticed three important points that you made in there that, uh, um, Central Asian energy situation, connectivity and energy security as such is relatively limited for the following three reasons. Inadequate planning, limited local countries involvement and unattractive business climate. And I couldn't agree more. But if we dig deeper and be a little bit critical of that, uh, one may say that for inadequate planning, there are actually a number of strategies, master plans developed by both uh, uh, local governments as well as the World Bank and ADB, right? The previous speaker uh, uh, referred to the World Bank data, right? So they are quite comprehensive and they are showing step by step what needs to be done, right? So why then Central Asian countries for the past three decades haven't achieved, uh, uh, you know, uh, noticeable results? for improving energy security in their countries? Aren't they listening to, to the reports and studies being conducted by uh, local and external experts? Second, limited local countries' involvement. Uh, having looked at the projects over the past couple decades, I noticed that the most successful ones are actually those in which the local uh, um, actors' involvement is limited. Right, so uh, Russian investors, Chinese investors, 
for large scale energy projects, building pipelines, building um, uh, like um, uh, oil and gas extraction facilities, European countries developing small scale disintegrated energy projects. Those were the most successful in which the local involvement was limited. And in those where the local uh, partners took the, the, uh, you know, um, the leading role, those were quite unsuccessful. Unattractive business climate, that's for sure. Most all Central Asian countries, they are quite low in terms uh, uh, for uh, conducting business, right, uh, ranking. But this is such a complex and comprehensive issue that I doubt Central Asian countries can get out of this situation and improve their ranking in the short to midterm perspective. So perhaps we need to think about how to uh, um, um, how to work in the environment of uh, uh, relatively uh, bad business climate. Uh, he also made very interesting uh, suggestions on how to improve the situation, like diversification of energy resources, uh, reducing dependence on external powers and regional cooperation. And again, these are excellent suggestions and I totally agree with them. Uh, um, the only thing that uh, actually the thought that came to my mind was that perhaps diversification of energy resources in the Central Asian context is incompatible with reducing dependence on external powers. Just look at the uh, data number, right? So Kazakhstan is way ahead of others and it's been doing a great job, but for the most part, the, the technology, uh, you know, parts of the renewable energy facilities. In fact, most of those facilities themselves are being built by, um, um, you know, foreign investors. Um, in Uzbekistan, if you look at, in, in, uh, at the case of Uzbekistan, they signed tens of billions of wars, uh, you know, uh, um, agreements with the Gulf countries, particularly Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates. They want to build gigawatts of uh, solar and wind um, energy, you know, facilities in, in, in Uzbekistan particularly. So far, the only the only successful example uh, that the country has is just 100 megawatt capacity solar power plant in Navai, right? And again, it was built by the Gulf investors. So maybe these two has to go hand in hand. And for the regional cooperation, I have been a strong advocate for regional cooperation for many years. But I think at this point, this is exactly what we're gonna get for regional cooperation, which is uh, a short term annually renewed, relatively um, limited export import like energy trade among Central Asian countries. And the moment new market emerges for Central Asia to export, like Afghanistan, Pakistan, India, or even China, as a matter of fact, they will probably uh, uh, even further reduce intra-Central Asian energy trade because others will probably be paying more, right? Uh, so, um, suggestions from my side, uh, what needs to be done? And again, uh, all the recommendations kind of, you know, for improving the situation in Central Asia, uh, you know, uh, have been written in a number of, you know, reports and, and, and studies conducted by both Central Asian experts, policymakers, as well as external, you know, uh, like foreign partners. But here are the things that I want to highlight from my side. I think it's very important that Central Asian countries develop comprehensive roadmap, what needs to be done. And in, in here, they do not use one size fits all strategy. Because if you look what is written right now, compare, com, compare studies done for Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, Tajikistan, they are all the same, same recommendations. We need to diversify the energy balance. We need to increase, uh, you know, enhance regional cooperation. We need to work on uh, um, tariff systems, right? They are quite similar. I think for in Central Asian context, separate, different kind of, you know, uh, roadmaps have to be developed for each country specifically. Second, uh, um, develop feasible plans for energy transition and modernization of the energy infrastructure. Like um, when, when Uzbekistan says that they want to uh, increase the share of the renewable energy in the overall energy balance up to eight gigawatts by 2030, which is like in seven years, 
I think this is not feasible, right? And um, so it's either not going to be achieved or it's going to be a very misleading policy, deviating kind of, you know, the policymakers and, and, and the government from issues that need to be uh, tackled right now. <clears throat> uh, third, uh, work with uh, inconvenient partners on inconvenient projects, right? So quite often we are being tempted by easy loans, by uh, partners, foreign partners who promise to come build everything for us uh, for a very cheap price, and then we'll solve all the energy problems. I wouldn't go that way. Right, so I would probably try to at least consider seriously uh, some projects being offered by um, European partners on a large scale. Right, uh, uh, like uh, they're going to be a little bit more expensive, but perhaps in the longer run it will pay off. Uh, um, last but not least, gain the trust for Central Asian governments, gain the trust of the population. Right, so uh, <clears throat> I think here we have a big time problem. It's really not about uh, increasing tariffs for local electricity or natural gas supplies. It isn't really about seasonal shortages, which cause energy crisis almost every single year. And, 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 and it's also not about uneven distribution of energy supplies across the region or countries. It's about trust. If, if the local population through awareness programs, right, uh, uh, realize that the government in partnership with private sector and multilateral institutions doing their best to address energy security problem, they will put up with short-term challenges for the sake of long-term prosperity and energy security. And I stop here. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for stating the three main reasons and three main suggestions. And also thank you for your advocacy for regional cooperation. I think that uh, your presentation uh, complement the uh, presentation of Dr. Savani House. And I think that our, part our participants will have many questions at the end of our discussion. Now, in light, in light of the insights shared by the previous speaker, our next presentation will focus on the challenges and advantages of transport corridors development in Central Asia by Dr. Shemyslov Ozerski, the thousand shift challenges and advantages of transport corridors development in Central Asia. Okay, thank you, Danis. But I, I don't claim, you know, the uh, doctoral degree still. I would work on this. Uh, okay, so starting um, and referring to uh, previous um, uh, previous experts, you know, I the Farhot mentioned uh, gain the trust. And gain the trust uh, is crucial in Central Asia if we discuss, um, let's say, the local level, if we discuss international level. Because uh, now uh, what we can see in Central Asia and also uh, how, let's say, um, other countries, uh, including Western countries, look at Central Asia is kind of uh, carrot and stick policies where the sticks are prevailing. Okay, so I will go to the, my uh, presentation. Okay, there's the moment, and we'll focus on my, um, and we'll focus on transport corridors and how the situation change. Okay, something wrong happened. Okay. We, I hope you can see my presentation. Yes. Now, because let's uh, let's say like because um, I'm trying to avoid uh, using the framework of the Ukrainian uh, Ukrainian Russian war. Yes, the Russo-Ukrainian war, uh, because it's somehow try many experts try uh, to frame uh, the development in Central Asia, development also in logistics sphere, uh, using um, let's say the. Uh, Russian invasion on Ukraine as a starting point, which, in my opinion, is um, is is not constructive. Okay, 
So let's start uh, with the global supply chain uh, crisis 2020-22 and how it's influenced uh, Central Asia. We had the COVID, uh, we had the COVID that um, interrupted uh, logistical bounds between the uh, between the Central Asian states, but also with the outside world. You know, the China only opened to Central Asia, I'd say, fully in January 23. And if we discuss Europe, uh, and I had the opportunity uh, to work in Uzbekistan at the time uh, as a Polish trade representative there, and I was looking like how Europe actually is closing its border to the Central Asia then. So there was a logistical interruption uh, in transported goods between Europe, uh, between Europe and Central Asia, and uh, it was looking that uh, uh, the roads within uh, Eurasian Economic Union uh, work pretty well then, despite all, let's say, limitation. Then we had the crisis um, um, on um, transporting, let's say, goods in Europe uh, in uh, January 22, uh, with, due to the events in Kazakhstan, and then only the Ukrainian, uh, Russia, Russia Ukrainian war started and, uh, the, and, and new problems uh, arise like the problem of sanction evasion, which is uh, now uh, discussed, let's say. And uh, what uh, global supply chain crisis uh, caused Central Asia? The Central Asia started to look for alternative ways, alternative roads of supplies. Also alternative ways of supplies, uh, transit roads that would not go through Russia, okay? And if we, we see this, we are looking um, at the north, but then Central Asia turn and make the shift to the south. But it was not, let's say, the, the total shift um, then. Uh, the story, let's say, started much earlier, okay? So there was the shift to the middle corridor. The middle corridor is more, let's say, controversial when they discuss, because it's going through the, let's say, unsanctioned territory uh, to the Uzbekistan, uh, Turkmenistan, and then through the, the, via uh, Caspian Sea uh, to, uh, let's say, Caucasus and to Turkey. And so, so it's less controversial. It's um, linked to the Belt and Road Initiative, as it is officially stated by uh, uh, Turkish authorities, and it's also linked to the uh, newly, let's say, to the planned uh, China Kyrgyzstan Uzbekistan Railway. And uh, NSTC. Why NSTC is important? Okay, NSTC importants um, growth with the Russia Ukrainian war but not really growth, but it was, uh, let's say, the worldwide, it brought worldwide attention to the, uh, to the project because Russia started to use the uh, corridor as uh, alternative transport, uh, alternative transport roads and also the military supplies. But uh, for Central Asia, uh, the road started to be explored uh, at least in uh, early 2021, uh, in Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan er, much earlier, Uzbekistan also much earlier. And now it seems that this is the road uh, that is going to be more, let's say, more and more developed. And there is initiative on both uh, Central Asian states and also on the other hand from the Iran, which is, uh, let's say, key partner in, in this. Um, why I mentioned in the beginning, um, let's say the problem of framing the project in the current context, okay? In Central Asia, we have the situation with landlocked developing countries. The landlocked developing countries, they have the inherent right to develop their connection with outside world for the sake of developing the nation. And this is, uh, let's say, the right that shall not be interrupted, I would say, somehow. Okay, so we're living in the world of international relation, different, let's say, uh, in certain configuration. Uh, we have uh, constraints coming from the, uh, let's say, ad hoc events, but it is um, from the point, from the, the perception of Central Asian states, they have the right to develop themselves. They have the right to build the connection with the outside world. And the day situation right now uh, is being constrained heavily by different, uh, let's say, uh, uh, political processes. Okay. So to uh, 
more, let's say, look at these processes and maybe the situation between, let's say, 2022. Uh, what is the Russian perspective on the region? The Russian perspective on the region is um, very diversified. Because if we look at the Kazakhstan, the Kazakhstan was always in the Russian projects, in Russian promoted project. It was part of the Valdai promoted uh, Central Eurasia. It was the part of, uh, let's say, backbone of um, Meridian corridors. And if we look at this, for example, at this uh, map, we see that uh, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, Tajikistan, uh, Afghanistan, they are missed from the Russian project. Due to the uh, Russia-Ukrainian war, the Russian, let's say, position um, in Central Asia, the in tools of influence on in Central Asia started to be diminished. Still, Russia is strong here, but the Central Asia gained, let's say, the momentum of developing alternative roads. It is visible on uh, NSTC, but it's also visible on, uh, uh, let's say, on the uh, China, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan railway project. When uh, during, let's say, the last decade, it was clear opposition of uh, Russian pro-Russian experts and Russian experts and also authorities that were opposing the project. Now the project came the moment. There is like uh, in, even in the last, let's say, few days, there were visits uh, uh, from authorities of uh, Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan to China to uh, launch the project. Okay. And here it's how I perceive this and why I tell about the LEDC right to develop their uh, transit their roads, uh, the connection with outside world. If we look at this uh, belt, we see that we have this, um, the sanctions that not only um, refer to the Russia, but we have the Iran under the sanction, and we have the China with very problematic relations and also some uh, personal sanction uh, imposed by United States now. So we see the belt and the, uh, the only, let's say, uh, unsanctioned road is middle corridor. And then we have um, uh, southern roads in STC and uh, it is difficult uh, to say, to, to tell um, uh, Central Asian uh, states, authorities, don't develop uh, transit roads through Iran, okay? Also don't develop the transit roads through, through China is difficult to say, but here it's, uh, it's, it's now um, uh, more visible that uh, the Central Asian states uh, authorities, they working to develop this corridor. In case of Kyrgyzstan, uh, here it's like how the Kyrgyzstan trying to escape, let's say the sanction belt, uh, looking at Russia, looking to are turning from Russia uh, towards, let's say, toward the South, toward Iran, and also toward India and Arab states. Uh, it should be mentioned, you know, the last uh, summit, Central Asia uh, Gulf summit, when uh, countries declared the cooperation also in this sphere. And then when we look at the um, problematic, problematic of the issue, of the sanctions and how the countries escape from the sanction. Okay, this is the positive, um, a positive meaning of sanction evasion, I would say, because we have the negative one with that, let's say, certain risk of imposing the sanction by Western countries on Central Asia due to the Russia Ukraine war. But here we have the positive. The sun, when, when the states look for the new transit roads, to escape, let's say, from this, this um, from the conflict, to, to go, to enter, let's say, a global market and global economy by using um, uh, Iranian ports, by using uh, Arab ports, okay? I could uh, discuss more in detail the Iranian port, but uh, we have the certain time constraint, okay? So let's uh, go to the, um, let's say, to the conclusion. Um, in the conclusion, I would say that now we see the um, new uh, situation in Central Asia. The, when uh, Central Asian countries are developing the new Southern, let's say, uh, roads, they moving their interest 
I would say not not totally because they cannot uh, be totally independent from Russia, from Russian economy. Russia still would be the partner. Uh, conflicts could last five years, ten years, but then the new, let's say, the economy shall restart. The new, let's say, the normal logistical connection, normal business shall restart. So now it's, um, I would say, it's it is good that um, Central Asian countries develop. Uh, new roads. They trying to get to the ports of Iran, to the port, to the Arab um, uh, ports, including Al Khalifa, United Arab Emirates. And uh, why it's important? Because by being in those ports, the Central Asia um, demonstrating that they could be, uh, let's say, the part of the global supply chain, that their goods can enter the global market, that the transits, the transport roads, they are working. And it's, um, it's their right to do this, okay? Uh, it's important because it would boost the development, uh, the development of those countries. Uh, it was mentioned before that there is a problem with developing um, uh, energy infrastructure, yes, but why are we developing energy infrastructure, energy, um, generating uh, capacities with we developing them to supply uh, let's say nation with uh, electricity to develop the local industry and uh, to develop local industry you need to have many factors um, many, many factors uh, um, working together and uh, logistic um, logistic is the key factor for the industry development, because Central Asian market are today developing internally, because we have demo, we have tremendous uh, uh, demographic growth. Uh, that's why we need the energy. But those people need to work somewhere. They need to produce something, and this uh, those goods must be exported. And uh, to export them, you need to have different alternative roads. Okay. Uh, and uh, potential risk, yes. Uh, the sanctions, um, the sanctions uh, are manageable, I would say. The sanctions are manageable. Uh, they should not be seen as kind of, uh, let's say, pr pressure uh, on, on countries, but uh, rather, let's say, advice. Okay, it's uh, that with the last case with the, with Kyrgyzstan when Washington Post published uh, let's say programmatic uh, article uh, about the poten potential of imposing sanction against Kyrgyzstan for the uh, sanction invasion. Okay, uh, in Kyrgyzstan it was perceived uh, in let's say not as a, let's say good advice but as a threat, you know, as a stick at the same time. And it's also like between experts, like here, it is clear that the uh, sanction invasion problem, and uh, it's, it's not the problem of Kyrgyzstan, it's the problem of Kazakhstan, it's the problem of Uzbekistan, it's the problem of Azerbaijan, Georgia, and so on. So the, all those countries, they have the corridors of supplying different goods to Russia. Uh, Mr. So Zosky, why I'm Kyrgyzstan was uh, then their uh, food? The so, left. Okay, so that is the, the issue, okay? It's, 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 it's nothing wrong with imposing, um, with enforcing um, sanctions to um, issuing certain warnings, yes? But the countries in Central Asia just want to be equally treated, you know, it's, uh, and not to be, uh, let's say, be seen as kind of scapegoat as in Kyrgyzstan is uh, now is seeing this. So, so, uh, so sanctions, actually fighting for peace, anyways, it, it's good, okay. But there must be, let's say, certain sensitiveness in using those tools, in using those tools to enforce the peace, to build uh, the peace. Okay, and then um, in STC, um, first of all, it should be seen as a reliable access to the port. Okay, and this sanction, even the sanction on Iran, should be, let's say, should be sh should be considered, but it should not be the core on the discussion of the in STC. Because even in case of Iran, we see, like, say, in the case of Port Chebahar, when it was necessary, 
uh, for the development of Afghanistan, the sanctions and the limitation on Chebahar, on the operation of Chebahar were limited. So there is a potential of um, um, being, let's say, constructive uh, on uh, in the, for Central Asian politics from the Western countries, including Kyrgyzstan. And uh, now uh, we see that uh, countries uh, in Central Asia, they using, let's say, the atmosphere, let's say, the international oh, relations. Sorry, Mr. Zosky, don't have time. Could you finish the presentation? It. Okay, thank you. So. Actually, I finished. I hope for the question uh, discussion. Uh, also, like uh, I didn't pay much attention to the middle corridor to the Ch China Kyrgyzstan Uzbekistan railroad, which is now uh, let's say I would say kind of hot topic. But I would be happy to to answer for the question. Okay, thank you. Thank you for explaining the influence of external actors in logistics and connectivity issues in Central Asia. Building on the previous discussion, let's now delve into the topic of sustainable connectivity in Central Asia uh, from Roman Vokulchuk, Vokulchuk, promoting sustainable energy connectivity in Central Asia. What is at stake? Uh, no, thank you very much for your kind introduction. <clears throat> I should say that it's always uh, risky to be the last speaker because many of the excellent ideas have been already uh, said and voiced, uh, but I would like to specify three particular points that relate to the strategic direction of Central Asia and in particular what is it at stake for the region in terms of decarbonization and uh, possible success or failure to decarbonize. So the first point is that uh, what we've seen over the last uh, five to ten years we see the increasing focus on um, well some of the success stories in terms of renewable energy development in the region and every year it's just like one percent increase in uh, the uh, use of uh, alternative energy in this, for example, energy mix, this is seen as a big success. And there's so much uh, expert uh, know, kind of focus on this uh, topic. Policymakers are also often bragging about like 1%, 2% increase. But the major issue here is I think decarbonization and there is a risk like for many uh, communities, which for example, solely depends on the use of fossil fuels, uh, in particular coal, uh, in some of the, for example, remote areas in Kazakhstan and so-called mono cities. So this is a big issue. Uh, and we're talking about here two to 400,000 uh, people who work and just service the coal industry. So that's another very important uh, issue that should be on the agenda of policymakers who are dealing with the decarbonization and renewable energy. So I think the, the focus should be balanced. Uh, also in terms of the, our expert knowledge that we produce on the topic, also in terms of uh, what kind of topics we as experts and scholars for Central Asia are covering in our research. Uh, the same relates to the work of NGOs, uh, of uh, SMEs, uh, well, also the work of mass media, but again, also international organizations and uh, expert communities. So that's, so that's first strategic uh, focus that I think at this stage, decarbonization should be at the core because it's the main source of emissions. That's still one of the main sources of uh, uh, employment for many people, and we are talking about uh, large, large-scale social implications in case decarbonization fails. My second point is that um, it's it's very important for the region to have a very good uh, strategic visioning with, with respect to the uh, infrastructure investment. And uh, we know that well, there are these two types of infrastructure, which is hard infrastructure and soft infrastructure. The first meaning, of course, roads, bridges, and the soft one meaning like uh, investment in people. But I think for Central Asia now, it's the time also to speed up and advance the investment in uh, digital infrastructure, because that's the area where Central Asia can have a uh, decent uh, comparative advantage compared to other countries. Uh, this is also the area where Central Asia, I mean, giving its, uh, you know, very spacious territory, uh, relatively uh, ease uh, of getting access to land or to use some some of the land in countries like especially Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan. It also has relatively developed uh, hard infrastructure. So it's time to focus on it and also think like why some of the biggest investors, uh, countries like China, for example, is not investing much in digital infrastructure for renewable energy, why it's not creating like a small scale, um, for example, um, 
solar panels or electricity grids, the same as China is doing in countries of Southeast Asia, like Vietnam, Indonesia, and so on. And this brings me to the third point of the strategic visioning is that, uh, well, basically everyone, every stakeholder in Central Asia should focus more on um, uh, basically comparing Central Asia, not with itself or with countries in the region, but rather looking at some of the successful uh, stories in the world. Uh, because when we talk about international investors, they want to know, like, uh, because they, they have access to any market, right? So they want to know, okay, what makes Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan special compared to some of the most successful nations, like, again, like countries like Vietnam, uh, like, again, countries like Australia, many other countries in Southeast Asia, because they manage to attract a lot of, uh, like, multi-billion US dollars every year into the renewable energy infrastructure, uh, well, solar panels, wind turbines, and so on, and meaning that investors find them most attractive. So in, for Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, it's, instead of comparing uh, the situation with each other, or like how they can basically perform in the region itself, I think it's time to, to go beyond that and go globally, seeing, okay, well, also what Central Asia can learn from countries of the Middle East. Again, what Central Asia can do in order to be maybe in some areas even more successful, more competitive than some of the countries uh, in, uh, in the Middle East. And this again brings me to this uh, factor of China, which I think is important that, well, we know that China is the biggest investors in renewable energy domestically and in the world. So, uh, but we know also that um, more than 95% of all Chinese investment in the energy sector has been in the oil and gas sector over the last 10 years. Again, I think the governments could do way, way more in order to kind of create very competitive, uh, you know, ground for new investors from other markets. And I'm um, supporting what uh, Parhot Aminjona was saying about that there is a need to invest uh, to, to improve the business uh, business climate. But I mean, uh, more has to be done to it to show that well, Central Asia has really some of the most comparative advantage. And if you ask me, like, what could it, could it be in terms of the practical recommendations? I would say, well, so Central Asia maybe should look at itself as being quite a stable region in Asia that is not really vulnerable to the rising sea level. To the fact that well, this rising civil could, could actually destroy some of the infrastructure, including roads, and digital infrastructure. So it can offer like quite a safe place for investors in this area, for example, in terms of data storage, to use the region. Of course, there's this issue of desertification and increasing temperatures, but I think this is this is uh, well something that can be dealt with. Uh, while of course, if we're talking about like hurricanes uh, caused by the climate change. This is way more challenging and risky for investors, for example, to invest in some of the coastal areas of uh, Singapore or Indonesia. So Central Asia has many advantages, but it has to be really specific uh, in terms of uh, showing like what it's un what's unique about it uh, in order to attract international investors. Uh, I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Makochuk. Thank you for your comments on the challenges of developing digital infrastructure in Central Asia. Your presentation allowed us to know what we can learn from other regions to attract more investments in our region. Before we move on to the Q&A session, we kindly ask all of you to fill out a short feedback form and evaluate the work of the speakers, organizers, as well as share your impressions. You can find the link to the feedback form in the chat box here. This will not take you more than five minutes and will help organizers to improve future events. Пожалуйста, запомните короткую форму обратной связи, оцените работу спикеров, организаторов. Please fill out this brief form. Please uh, rate the work of presenters and organizers. We have, uh, several questions in the chat box. The first question is from Rahu Gupta. A speaker in the panel referred to connectivity with South Asia. It seems to me it's a question referred to uh, Dr. Aminjonov. Can any speaker shed some insights on Central Asia, South Asia connectivity, especially in the wake of the Taliban's return to power in Afghanistan? Also, since Uzbekistan was leading the project of Central South Asia connectivity until 2021, how does it see it going forward? Uh, oh, well, all right. Uh, do you want me to answer? Yeah. Yes. Sure, I can go ahead. Uh, um, well, um, <laughs> Very good question. There is a huge potential, despite the fact that I really don't like the word potential, especially in the Central Asian context, 
because usually the potential is the uh, end stop here, right? So we don't uh, go uh, much beyond that yet. Uh, in general, I look at Central Asia, South Asia energy cooperation, you know, um, positively, and I will explain why. So um, first, first of all, if we look into just a little bit back into the history, plans to extend this cooperation to South Asian countries has been on the agenda since 1990s, right? Just look at TAPI project, look at CASA project, TUTAP, they're all kind of, you know, project decades long. So um, this whole idea was there, but it wasn't really moving much forward. Uh, um, now the reality is different. Many people look at Taliban as the biggest threat and uh, it's not going to get anywhere uh, um, still, but uh, I have a different opinion on that. Uh, first of all, Central Asian countries now look at South Asia as a gateway to Indo-Pacific region, like a broader Indo-Pacific region, right? And we highlighted this uh, in the following presentations here. If before, Central Asia looked at South Asia as the potential market for energy only. When I was talking to Afghan experts, they were all saying like three, four, five years back that uh, um, like trains carrying goods uh, uh, from Afghanistan to Central Asia and beyond were going just one way, right? Full of Afghan uh, uh, kind of, you know, uh, full of Afghan products to Central Asia, but nothing was coming uh, uh, into the region. Uh, so now Central Asia wants to develop broader economic ties with the entire region and energy is going to be just one part of it, right, which I think uh, uh, um, can lead to a success. Uh, second issue, security, right, uh, uh, for, for, for security reasons. Before Taliban was a major force, Taliban was actually controlling most of the country in Afghanistan. Well, I'm talking about Afghanistan because all the roads to Pakistan and India, they lead through uh, Afghanistan, right? For the most part, uh, energy infrastructure. Uh, now Taliban is in power and they will probably stay in power for some time. And there is no major force that can pose threat to energy infrastructure as such. There is Islamic State of Khorasan province and they are causing trouble uh, here and there from time to time, but not the major resistance as before. And uh, um, third, probably escalating nature of energy insecurity uh, in the entire region, right? Uh, driven by climate change. Um, in Pakistan, in Afghanistan, in India, there will be the demand uh, for energy resources will continue to grow. And uh, Central Asia, apparently one of the few regions that can contribute to addressing this problem. And considering all of this, I think it's not gonna happen tomorrow or the day after tomorrow, but I look at this prospects from a positive light. Thank you. Thanks a lot for your insights, Dr. Amin Jonov. Um, I have seen that Dr. Sabonis Hef and Dr. Ozerski have raised their hands. Uh, could you start please, uh, Dr. Sabonis Hef? Yes, uh, Farhad did a very nice job talking about Afghanistan. I want to raise a point that is poorly understood about Pakistan. And that is, at the time when CASA 1000 was being negotiated and put into place, um, Pakistan was in a significant electricity crisis. In an effort to address that crisis in the fastest way possible, um, Pakistan signed an agreement with China for the very rapid construction of coal-fired power plants. Um, and at the present moment, Pakistan no longer has the kind of desperate need for new electricity that they had before. And this is one of the things that has contributed to the slowing of CASA 1000. However, once it is completed, the hydropower, um, presuming climate conditions allow, the, the, the hydropower is actually very competitive and Pakistan is already beginning to regret the intensity with which they went after coal. So when you ask about opportunities to export to South Asia, at the moment, Pakistan was a desirable market. Um, it's not currently the most desirable market, but I believe that to be a temporary step. And we do believe that um, the transition to the Taliban has delayed progress by probably two years, but that CASA 1000 will move forward. CASA is the least, the less complex, the two big regional projects. TUTOP is going forward slowly, but the purpose of TUTOP 
is to connect all of Afghanistan to itself. And so that one is also very significantly hampered by uncertainty about, about the Taliban and how they will manage this project. Thank you. Mr. Azarski. Okay. Uh, talking about uh, Uzbekistan. Now, Uzbekistan is a very constructive country if we discuss the relation with Afghanistan. It's the country that probably would be the first to recognize the Taliban's government. Okay. Uh, the Afghanistan did, did not disappear after the, with the Western withdrawal in the 2021. It's still there. The country is there. People are there. The nation is there. And they must be somehow approached. They must be um, somehow um, engaged in regional cooperation, in international cooperation. And it is the must for the region to develop. It's a huge market, it's a huge opportunity. Uh, people tend uh, also to use only this negative framework, but we must actually to look for the constructivity in working with, uh, with, with Afghanistan, even with uh, the Taliban government. The latest, let's say they were the latest meeting, their technical, um, let's say, side within the government of the Taliban that must be engaged in cooperation because uh, if they would be not engaged, uh, the, the Afghanistan would develop in such a way that could um, pose the threat, could uh, endanger the water security in the region, the energy, energy security in the region. And Uzbekistan is very constructive. It's in this case, really, it's uh, the Uzbek um, authorities must be praised for keeping the line open to engaging this because we, it failed. The Western engagement in Afghanistan failed, 21. There is still the lack of the accountability in concern the Western engagement in Afghanistan. It's bad because the West actually moved from the Afghanistan to Russia-Ukrainian war. And still, and the problem is still there. The problem which is very important, uh, not the problem, the issue, the issue which is very important for the Central Asian region, how to engage, how to engage the Afghanistan right now. Okay, thank you. Thanks a lot for your assessments on the, of the actions of the Central Asian countries towards Afghanistan, especially since there was a meeting, uh, a meeting yesterday in Astana, a business forum between Kazakhstan and Afghanistan. Um, I see that Mr. Ikromi has raised his hand, or would you like to say something? Okay, it's not the case. So we can move on to other questions. Here's another question about uh, situation in the energy sector in Central Asia is still waiting for a solution. The consum consumers of energy produced among themselves, themselves, what are the prospects for selling energy to the world market in this situation? The question is from Yudus Hon. Um, I can try to answer this question. Okay. <laughs> um, so, um, Central Asia cannot can well um, can cannot be an exporting region of energy resources to the world market, right? Because Central Asia is landlocked. So oil and gas exports, they are like uh, oil and gas is primarily being transported by uh, large diameter pipelines, right? And, and, and pipelines politics, they dictate regional coverage, right? So it's always going to be uh, um, a regional player in terms of energy supplies. Um, there is just a little bit of Kazakh oil, which is being shipped through swap kind of, you know, uh, agreements uh, to some distant countries. Uh, but um, no, region as such cannot be, uh, can, cannot be fully integrated into the world uh, um, uh, energy trade. So it will always be limited by this broader uh, Eurasian, uh, Eurasia, South Asian region. Um, the kind of, you know, uh, the question here is, to what extent the regional coverage can be extended, right? Um, so uh, Turkmenistan exports natural gas to Russia, uh, to China, central, like, uh, you know, um, Kazakhstan exports oil uh, and gas. So basically it's Russia, China, and a little bit of uh, Afghanistan, which are which three countries 
where where this regional expansion ends for the moment and it's linked to my previous uh you know comment uh developing relationships with South Asian countries going beyond Afghanistan to Pakistan to India to Iran, for instance. Many consider Iran to be energy rich country, but in fact, every single year they experience even worse energy crisis than Central Asian countries. Right. So and there is infrastructure in place, pipeline, transmission lines connecting Iran and Turkmenistan. So we can go in that direction as well. Um, I doubt Turkmenistan or Kazakhstan will manage uh, uh, you know, to reach European market, you know, uh, bypassing Russia in, in, in the short term perspective, or even if they do this, it's not going to be a significant amount. So trying, trying going beyond Russia, China and Afghanistan is the only option uh, uh, for us. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for explaining the terms of Central Asian states to bypass uh, the territory of, of, of the Russian Federation. Um, Dr. Sabanis Health, would you like to add something? Yes, a, a few points. One is that many years ago, because of its precarious situation, um, Turkmenistan led the region in export of electricity. Um, and they are likely to continue in that role. They've enjoyed some success. Um, there is criticism that they've built their electricity system more to export than um, to supply their own people. Um, but they have been very effective in the way they've set it up and the kind of grid they've designed gives them a flexibility of ex exporting electricity that they never could have enjoyed with the export of natural gas. It also creates jobs and, and adds some value. So there's some logic to that piece of the Turkmen strategy. Um, many people were hopeful that resolving the status of the Caspian Sea would make it more possible to uh, lay permanent infrastructure. Um, it may be the case, although there's some challenges to it, um, that uh, the current sanctions regime is shifting Kazakhstan's perception. Um, bear in mind that Azerbaijan has already passed peak oil and is in decline. So it is interested in getting more oil in the existing infrastructure, but the quality of Kazakh oil is, is fundamentally different than the quality of Azeri oil. And so there is that tension. Um, but when we look at undersea pipelines to transport gas, there has always been this sort of residual hope that Turkmenistan would get involved. Um, one point moving toward the positive and one toward the negative. Um, the Nord Stream 2 pipeline explosion uh, reminded everyone that undersea pipelines have a set of 21st century risks that we didn't think about a lot. From an engineering perspective, Undersea pipelines are very stable. They're less affected by weather than overland pipelines. And so it was sort of thought that if the complexity of laying the pipeline is sort of compensated for by the ease of its management. Um, with the mass associated with Nord Stream 2, there's new risks and concerns. Um, there's also evidence of how easy it is to conduct an attack on a pipeline. So that raises some new concerns. Um, on the positive side, Turkmenistan has demonstrated a clear commitment to reducing its methane emissions, and a lot of those methane emissions are associated with venting and uh, with venting of natural gas that occurs in association with oil. There is a good prospect that Azerbaijan will cooperate with Turkmenistan in capturing gas that's currently flared in the Caspian Sea and using it more efficiently. This is not non-carbon. This is not low carbon but this is better management of natural gas and methane resources to reduce the side effects associated with energy exploitation. And I don't think we should discount um, the importance of that. Um, Azerbaijan's done a very good job um, exploiting resources and doing it relatively efficiently. It would be an excellent thing for the region um, and arguably for um, emissions if Turkmenistan were to improve its efficiency in those sectors. Thank you for your critical points, Mr. Ozerski. Okay, maybe I would be like more optimistic and I believe like, for example, Kyrgyzstan could become, you know, despite the fact that uh, now um, in Kyrgyzstan, we are in the state of uh, emergency in energy sphere, but it's for three years. 
but some projects uh, they are planned to be finished in uh, 2030. So in uh, seven, we need to look like maybe in seven years, in eight years, the Kyrgyzstan from, from the country that has the problem with uh, uh, meeting energy demand uh, inside the country would start to export. Uh, why I'm optimistic? Because some projects actually they designed for the export. Okay? If we look, for example, for the river, uh, uh, let's say Sarijas in, uh, in, in Kyrgyzstan and the potential engagement of uh, China's investor. Uh, those um, hydropower plants, they're designed to export to China. So we have the example for the export. Uh, for the project for the export, yes. And if we see the latest uh, uh, declaration from the Chinese side to build the cascade on the Narin River, it's also, it's not only for the, dem for the um, domestic demand, it's also for the export, okay? So in electricity, I think that Central Asia, if uh, water resources would be properly managed, okay? If there would be, let's say, investment governance in place and uh, there's new infrastructure, would be used properly. It's not like one year project, it's like seven, 10 years project. So then maybe we will see, uh, let's say for them, Kyrgyzstan exporting to the, to the let's say, um, uh, to the outside markets, okay? So, uh, and in case of gas, yes, in natural gas, um, it, there was the mention of the era, you know, I'm, also would say that there is like structural problem with Iran and they have the problem with the electricity, with the gas, uh, but it is also like kind of uh, caused uh, with the um, technological problems caused by sanctions. So we have this domino effect. And um, if uh, Iran could serve as, uh, let's say the window of export for Central Asia, yes, because it's also, it's now uh, some, let's say Tur Turkmen gas is being say, sent to the global market via, uh, like say, swap uh, swapped transactions, yes. So it is possible to use, let's say, to enter the, um, to enter uh, global market, even without the hard infrastructure in place, okay? So I would be more optimistic than Farhot. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for your insights. Um, do our speakers want to add something to the topic? Okay, uh, let's get to another question. Here's a question on energy. It's not the first time that the need for decarbonization is broadcasted and immediately followed by the need to switch to nuclear power. Isn't decarbonization a lobby for nuclear power and renewable energy? I'm Is not Dr. Oh, sorry. Okay, yes, Dr. Savanis have. Since I was the one who initially raised nuclear power. Yes. So what you should understand is that as we move more and more toward decarbonization, there are a couple of engineering puzzles that have to be addressed. One is sectors such as steel that are very hard to decarbonize. And the lead engineering sort of preference in that sector is to start thinking about the role hydrogen might play. Another problem as we move increasingly toward decarbonization is we assume, and the International Energy Agency makes this assumption. So this is not um, necessarily an organization that has a preference for renewable energy. Um, the International Energy Agency predicts that as we move toward decarbonization and into a digital era, right now in the world, electricity is only about 20% of the way that we use energy. You also use energy for gasoline in your vehicle. You also use um, oil and gas in industry and so on. Um, so only 20% of the energy that most people use is in the form of electricity. The IEA is predicting a dramatic shift. We are moving towards a world where half of the energy we use, we, we are expected to use in the form of electricity. So what that means is we're trying to move toward renewable energy, but we're also in a world where every country is going to want more electricity. So part of the question is, how do we shift away from fossil fuels? Another part of the question is, how do we deal with the fact that there's a, a growing demand for electricity? And really the two big answers that we have right now, one is um, 
is about better energy electricity storage. And that has to do with better batteries. That has to do with better ways of storing electricity. And the other leads a lot of experts, not all of them, to say that we have to think again about nuclear. And the reason why we think about nuclear in a decarbonized world is that the threats and pollutants produced by nuclear energy are not in the form of greenhouse gases. I would encourage you to think about greenhouse gases as an upper atmosphere pollutant. We've never really thought about it as being important. It doesn't affect our air quality in the same way that smog does. So we think that it's nothing. Well, we've got the overwhelming scientific evidence. It's not nothing. Upper atmosphere threats are very significant to the planet. And that, for many people, shifts how we're willing to think about um, nuclear energy. It is not without risks, but it is without carbon. And if we manage the risks associated with nuclear energy and fully acknowledge what's going on there, um, many people do believe that it's part of decarbonization. But you're correct to say that not everybody likes that association of how come when we say decarbonization, lots of people say, oh, that means you must have nuclear. The answer is if the world needs more and more electricity and less and less carbon, we have to think, we have to review the infrastructures and the things that we already know how to do, because so much of what we want to accomplish by 2050, we do not yet have the technology for. Indeed, shift from fossil fuels is very important for Central Asia, but some particular challenges are present here in the region. I think that Dr. Minjonov wants to say something to that. Yeah, yeah, it's just, you know, uh, to add uh, uh, on what uh, has been already said, um, decarbonization is a process, right? So it's not, it's not the end target. Like uh, carbon neutrality, this is something we want to achieve, but decarbonization is the process. And in the context of Central Asia, I, um, I wouldn't say that the decarbonization process is being led or driven by some sort of nuclear or renewable energy lobby. Uh, first of all, I don't think this lobby exists in Central Asia in the first place. And, and, and second, why uh, uh, renewable energy sector is being developed, why uh, there are talks and negotiations on nuclear energy uh, development in Central Asia. Um, again, uh, uh, in, in my opinion, it's not it's not for the sake of decarbonization. It's more to address energy security problems in the country, right? So we are trying to tap on existing fossil fuels, but uh, it is it's becoming more and more difficult to attract foreign investment uh, in the fossil fuel uh, industry, right? Uh, um, and uh, um, even if you look at the cost factor, um, I think it's been two years now uh, that the solar power uh, has become cheaper than the coal power. Like to build a coal power plant, thermal power plant, uh, uh, you know, uh, running on coal is more expensive from scratch. It's more expensive than building solar power plant. So it has also economic rationale behind it. In Central Asia, we just want to address energy security challenges and the uh, diversity of the energy sector uh, in favor of renewables and nuclear energy is uh, uh, um, one of the options. If Central Asia with this succeeds to somehow reduce carbon emission level, be part of this decarbonization process. Yeah, good for us, good for the world. Thank you. Thank you. I see that um, Mr. Eschanov has raised his hand. Thank you. Welcome. Kudos for pronouncing my surname correctly from the first attempt. Hello, nice to see everyone. Hello, uh, Professor Aminjanov, Professor Vakulchik. Nice to see you, speakers. Very useful and uh, beneficial presentations. Thank you all. I'd like to uh, provide a few comments and then a bit uh, pose one general question. Uh, Sorry for pronouncing the surnames wrong on my side now. Professor Sebonis Haif, uh, very interesting, useful presentation. And I would like to emphasize that you have uh, for a for, uh, <clears throat> foreigner who is uh, shedding light on Central Asia, foreign professor, researcher who is shedding light on Central Asia, you have touched upon and brought more pieces together. And uh, I'm very impressed. However, the cost-reflective electricity 
prices are not uh, the case for all Central Asian uh, countries because they do not value the fossil fuels with which they generate electricity in a market price, using a market price. They use internal price and that's what we call subsidies. Polit sometimes we refer to them as political subsidies. And that's why I would argue that uh, especially for Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, and Kazakhstan, uh, electricity prices are not cost reflective. Uh, I'll come back to the nuclear question that you have touched upon a bit later. Uh, as for Roman Vakulchik's point on decarbonization, he, as uh, Professor Amin Janov has mentioned, it is not on the agenda of the government. Uh, and I believe that it's not on the agenda of the government of Uzbekistan and some other neighboring countries. I'm not very sure about Kazakhstan, how well they are doing with uh, decarbonization issue task, but for Uzbekistan, it's completely the questions of question of investment. No one I'm wants apologizing, to- uh, Mr. Ashchanov, uh, we don't have much time. Could you speed up the questions? All right. Uh, the Thank you. Two minutes, uh, all right. Uh, Professor Ozerski, value chains, you have touched upon the value chains issue and very interesting perspective. Uh, Central Asia is at the bridge, brick of, of uh, stepping to a new business environment. If they are capable of uh, becoming a very uh, decent value chain supplier for the renewable energy technologies, for the renewable energy uh, raw materials, they may uh, break their current aura of uh, being tapped and being doubly landlocked and become a new partner, may create new economic opportunities. Uh, this is uh, the last Thing. I would. I had some comments on Afghanistan, but I'm going to cut that short. But uh, being here in Uzbekistan, inside the country, I am looking at the discussions and seeing something uh, uh, slightly different than the issues you are rising and uh, discussing here. Uh, for for Uzbekistan, for instance, uh, after years of uh, tariff freezing we are heading to tariff reforms in a situation where our generation capacity, transmission capacity is outdated. Um, and Mr. in a way, one, one more minute, very important. Uh, minute, uh, okay. sorry, uh, uh, please, thank you for- Okay, very much. then uh, I will interrupt you. Central Asia, one so Central Asia, for Uzbekistan, the supply infrastructure is about to collapse and we are, heading to a tariff reform where we are uh, thinking of, we are planning to increase the tariffs by some folds. For gas, it's six, seven folds, and electricity, at least two folds. So there is another time bomb that is ticking in the country uh, as we head to a harsh winter. So the, the issues are slightly different than what we are discussing here. Thank you, and sorry for taking your precious time. Thanks a lot, thanks a lot. Dr. Sabani's health. To your points, and I think they're very important points, um, there's two separate issues. One is in the electricity sector, you try to achieve cost recovery. And what that means is you want to design an electricity sector where the government has to does not have to continually put in money. Because if the government has to continually put in money, there will always be political decisions about who gets the power and how it is directed. Um, I don't mean to suggest that um, Central Asia has fully achieved cost recovery, but going from zero cost to being able to regulate and charge and meter and so on does represent significant progress. Um, one of the critical things that you should keep in mind is look at Europe. Europe had very carefully targeted subsidies to only help the poor. Of course, a blanket energy subsidy subsidizes the rich unfairly because the rich use more electricity. In um, Europe, they had very carefully targeted subsidies until this year. The increases in price caused by the Russo-Ukraine war had created a situation where, if you can imagine this, Germany spent 
7% of their GDP just getting their own people through the winter. Those are massive levels of subsidy for a very rich country. And now Germany is having a hard time figuring out how to walk that back and get out of the business of subsidizing everyone. So never underestimate the extent to which it is politically extremely difficult to take away subsidies. But when subsidies are not carefully targeted to those who need them, they unfairly favor the rich. Um, and in this, strangely enough, Iran is very rare um, because Iran actually issued a fatwa on electricity that argued that to subsidize the rich more than the poor was morally wrong. And so the electricity pricing structure in Iran is very deliberately targeted to help the poor. And it's one of the few countries that has consistently done that. In gasoline, their subsidies are to everyone. But in electricity, Iran is one of the few countries that has targeted them well. So Uzbekistan has a challenge, and the challenge is to try to target the subsidies rather than making them blanket ones. And do not underestimate how politically difficult that is. That is an extraordinary project and a necessary one. Thank you, Dr. Sabanis Hef, especially for explaining Iranian FATFA. And dear all, wrapping things up, I must admit, today's discussion showed many important and diverse aspects of the topic explored by our experts. In a short time, we were able to discuss a large number of important topics and raise our awareness on the issue. We had even an opportunity to hear valuable comments from Mr. Eschanov. We, we could have discussed alternative energy sources. Sources. We could even we could have discussed Transafghanian roles, trans-Iranian roles, uh, experience of different countries concerning the topic we were discussing. We could uh, we have started with a presentation of uh, Dr. Sabani's health concerning um, concerns of raising demands, uh, electricity demands in Central in Central Asia, uh, followed by the presentation of Dr. Aminjonov about three main reasons and three main suggestions and uh, <laughs> um, advocacy for regional cooperation within Central Asia and about connectivity. Uh, between Central Asia and South Asia. After that, we had an uh, opportunity to hear the presentation of Mr. Azor of Mr. Azorsky explain, uh, explaining our um, different diversification opportunities of um, roles passing through the territory of Central Asia and with sources and goods from Central Asia passing through the territory of other countries like Russia and Trans uh, Caspian. International uh, Transport Road, uh, and uh, finished by the presentation of Dr. Vakulchuk, explaining us uh, some other uh, soft and hard measures to, to improve uh, regional infrastructure and explaining us digital infrastructure and also some um, comparing experience of some other countries in attracting foreign investments in this sphere. I thank our speakers for being here with us tonight. Thank you for your time, for your insights, and for your recommendations. I hope everyone enjoyed the event. The panel highlight will be published on Kyber Asia platform following tonight's event, and the recording will be uploaded on Kyber Asia YouTube channel. Look it up and subscribe. Stay tuned for such expert meetings in the future. Please also follow IVPR Central Asia social media channels and the website kabar.asia and join the upcoming events.